Hi, everyone. I guess we're going to get started. Um, thanks for coming to the session. Uh, that's a really long title up there, dynamic. It looks, looks even bigger up on the screen. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, what we did at Time Warner Cable Cloud, but more specifically some problems we had we were trying to solve from a security perspective and some of the solutions um, we looked at in the space and what we settled on. Um, so just for some introductions, uh, my name is Jason Ruolt. Um, I was the, I, was, I say was, because I, I recently left, the Senior Director of Cloud Engineering Operations at Time Warner Cable um, and slash Charter. Um, I also have here today with me Richard Eisenberg um, and Nathan Randall from Cloud Advisory um, that are going to help uh, do a demo at the end. I'm going to I'm going to move pretty fast because I want to get to the demo because that's a cool part, and I'd like to also save time for questions. So, forgive me if I if I fly through. I do want to give a little bit of context on just the Time Warner Cable Cloud, so you guys know what we're talking about. Um, then I'm going to spend some time talking about the security problems. Um, in a little bit of depth, uh, and then, and then uh, visit some of the architectural requirements we had for a security solution, and then we'll do that demo. Um, so those, for those of you who do not know Time Warner Cable, they're second largest, they were the second largest cable provider uh, in the U.S. Um, they you know, provide video, broadband, phone, you know, business services, that type of thing. They had uh, four national data centers, they had over 20-some market um, uh, data centers spread across the U.S., and they were in the Los Angeles and uh, New York markets. Uh, they were acquired by Charter Communications last year, um, so if, if you may know that name uh, better than Time Warner Cable. Uh, the cloud, just to set some context, so the cloud that we built um, was based on OpenStack um, at Time Warner Cable, and it was set up to run across the two, two of the national data centers, um, supporting about 15,000 VMs. Um, we had three petabytes of usable object and block storage, multiple tiers. We provided all the kind of core IIS services you would expect from an OpenStack cloud, plus some enabling services like load balancing as a service, um, database as a service, monitoring as a service, and so forth. Um, we were using uh, Neutron for SDN. Uh, with, with, we were using ML2, the VXLAN overlay. We were using OBS. Um, we were very happy with that. Um, I do want to point out that we weren't using anybody's distribution. Um, we were rolling our own from the community. Uh, we had full CI CD in place um, in automation. And, and for some of the services, we were um, you know, just a few weeks behind trunk. Um, and that'll become an important point later in the presentation. So just remember that. Um, and then uh, why OpenStack? It's the same reason everybody uses it. It's, we believed it was the most flexible an adaptable uh, you know, infrastructure that we could put in place uh, for a private cloud. Most importantly, though, it, it provided self-service kind of like AWS to our, to our internal users, and that's what we really wanted. So we had a lot of great things you get from OpenStack, and you know, we love the multi-tenancy, we like the abstraction layer, the self-service, the speed it gave our users to be able to you know, reliably and consistently deploy their applications. That was awesome. It also, at the same time, it also exposed some problems. Um, the architecture, and it's not necessarily an OpenStack uh, only architecture, but the cloud architecture that was introduced here actually presented some problems around what traditional, some of the traditional sec perimeter security tools had a hard time detecting and controlling. Um, for example, you know, we were really concerned about horizontal breakouts, so something happening within one of our customers' um, tenant networks on a VM, um, and then it, it breaking out east-west. That was, that was a big concern for us, um, and we, there was no, we had no tooling in place to, to be able to manage that concern. Um, the other problem that we had was technology problem, but it was also as much a cultural problem, was we had this weird dichotomy now between the security and network teams and the DevOps teams that were building applications on, on, the, on the cloud. Um, it was kind of a tug, a tug of war thing. You know, how much control do you give the DevOps teams to manage their security group rules and policies for their applications themselves versus how much control and insight do you give the security teams uh, you know, to, uh, for those applications and the deployment of them? And it, that, was, that, was a, that was a big problem, um, and it was, it was really magnified by the self-service nature of the cloud. So let me get into the actual business problems here. And I've broken them down in a couple categories. The first one is visibility. 
uh, essentially the cloud is a black box from a networking perspective to most of its consumers. Um, if you look at the DevOps team and the people that are consuming the cloud, um, they have very limited visibility and often lack of understanding of how the networking works or how to do security group rules and things like that. Uh, and that makes it very hard for them to onboard applications to troubleshoot applications. They have no idea what's going on um, when their application doesn't work. Uh, and a lot of times what they do is uh, when things don't work, they go in and they just open up all the security group rules just to kind of eliminate that, hey, it's not something with the security. Um, and then unfortunately, sometimes those don't get locked back down. So that's an issue. And, then, and that visibility problem actually gets magnified as, you, as those applications span you know, from your OpenStack cloud maybe back into your traditional data center or span across regions or to other cloud providers. Uh, it, it just gets magnified. From a security team perspective, they also lack the visibility. How do they monitor and validate that the security controls that were agreed to are actually put into place and being enforced? Uh, that, uh, that was a problem. And then I don't have it up here, but from an operational standpoint, um, how do people that are operating the cloud troubleshoot and fix things and support their customers? If I always wanted um, and always thought it would be great nirvana if I could have a holistic view of my environment and all the resources, the providers, the workloads, and the data flow between them. Where's the data flowing? What ports um, and uh, where things are being denied, that type of thing. That would really uh, have been very helpful, and that's actually what we wanted to get to. The next uh, uh, problem area had to do with control. So the um, security controls in OpenStack using security groups and rules are pretty easy to get wrong um, and error prone, and that that's, can be a bad thing. Um, if you, it's very it's very easy. You can go in and break your application, or worse, leave it in a vulnerable state, uh, and then uh, you you know you you get attacked. And then managing these controls actually doesn't really scale uh, with large deployments. It's fine when you have a 10 VMs, 20 VMs, you get to 100. And we start getting to thousands of VMs, and then you start talking about different environments. You've got devs, staging, production, and then again, potentially regions, uh, multiple regions and providers. It, it doesn't scale real well. It's really hard to manage that, which gets to my next point about, you know, these controls actually really need to be dynamic, okay? Yeah, you can script security group rules. You can use heat templates, um, things like that. You can use Ansible. That's great, but not all the consumers of the cloud use those tools, know how to use those tools, um, or have the ability to do that. We needed something that was kind of more inherent in the environment, and also it was very simple. Um, if you're familiar with how Kubernetes works and uses labels, um, I really kind of envisioned a kind of a context-based approach to security. So because this application, this workload had, a, had metadata that um, you know, it's a production workload. It's in it's in US East and it's PCI. The security controls automatic should automatically go into place. And as it scales out, the security controls should scale out with it. And then as it moves between environments, the security controls should change. And then the last point here is really around the idea of who manages those security controls or security group rules. Um, in, in our environment, it was it dependent on the application, um, the business owner of that application, and, and if it was the IT side of the house or the subscriber side of the house. So sometimes the DevOps team actually managed the security controls. In other cases, the security team did. Um, and the, the problem that that represented is that we had, a, we had a mixed use environment. We had one cloud where people were running production, dev, test, a whole different set of heterogeneous set of workloads. Um, and so we're leveraging that same cloud and things need to be secured differently. Um, you're not necessarily gonna wanna lock down your test environment um, so much um, SO as you would your production environment, which requires PCI. Um, so I want, we wanted to have the ability to define a trust zone, you can give it another name, but it's a way of grouping workloads um, based upon you know, VMs within a project, across projects, or grouping of projects where you could, you could then say that you have these, these are your administrators, these are the people who can define policy. Um, and that, we, that just wasn't there natively in OpenStack. The next area is compliance. Uh, it's a, 
it's a big one. And the problem here is how do you demonstrate um, compliance? How do you how do you know when or how do you know what the, what the security group rules are in place right now and that they match the compliant rule set that was agreed to? Um, and even more so, have those security rules changed, right? So being able to track that uh, is very difficult. And then detecting and responding to events is problematic as well. Like how, how fast are you gonna be able to detect that somebody changed a security group rule, potentially exposed an application, um, and then be able to go back in and, and fix that? Or what if there's malware on a VM and we start having this horizontal breakout how fast will you be able to detect that and, and, and mitigate that? Those were real concerns for us. So we started looking at, okay, well, we need a solution here, and what are gonna be the requirements? And most of these requirements are kind of uh, architectural requirements um, because you know, we, we were building and managing our own cloud, and we, we needed to make sure it worked within that environment. The first one is we, we needed it to, to be, let, whatever we implemented needed to use cloud-aware security. That means, it, there, shouldn't have been, there shouldn't be another security controller in the environment. That would just make it even more difficult for us to operate and support the environment. It just complicates things. The next piece is our users really came to like self-service, so we didn't want to have to, we didn't want a solution that came in and locked things down that they weren't able to move fast anymore, right? If, if they can spin up a VM and hook it all up and, and um, you know, really quickly and all of a sudden they, they need to wait to get somebody to set security group controls, um, that, that wasn't gonna be good for them. They needed to continue to move fast. The third point here is the most critical. We had a lot of mission critical workloads um, where performance was key. They were customer facing. Um, and you know, serving up uh, video over IP, things like that. We needed to make sure that any solution had minimal to no impact on the workload performance. And our cloud was growing fast. We needed to make sure the solution scaled with our cloud as it grew. That was key, uh, because it, and because of the mission critical cloud, anything that was in our cloud needed also um, be highly available itself. Installation and upgrades of whatever solution we were gonna implement needed to tie into our CI-CD system. We didn't wanna have any snowflakes. Um, everything needed to be managed the same way in our environment, um, and, mo and more importantly, whatever we put in place couldn't hinder our ability to, to do deploys to production. We deployed to production uh, multiple times a week. Um, we didn't want anything to, be, to prevent us from you know, updating the kernel, updating the OS, or updating any of the OpenStack services. Um, Role-based access control, that's tied to the notion I mentioned earlier about being able to kind of group administrators over, over certain workloads. Um, and then, of, and of course, an API so that you can integrate. So those are the requirements, and we started looking at, okay, what are our choices um, here? There are some uh, vendors out there. Um, there are some things we could cobble together ourselves. And we were able to kind of narrow things down pretty quickly. So sometimes you'll go out and you'll see there's some vendors that are actually doing things in this space, uh, and what they want to do is they want to take over your SDN or they provide an SDN. And we're like, well, that's, that's a no-go. We're, we're really happy with our implementation. Um, it's working great for us. Don't want to do that. Another approach often is you'll see, okay, install a VM on every hypervisor and that's gonna be controlling all the traffic flowing um, uh, for the peers on that, hi on that hypervisor. Um, while that is a, a viable approach and we we're kind of open to that, we had some concerns that that's just gonna further complicate kind of our, um, uh, our ability to kind of support the environment and the tools we had as far as doing rolling upgrades and moving workloads around and things like that. Um, so we decided, oh, probably don't want to do that. Um, other solutions involve uh, a kernel module, and we decided, no, we definitely don't want anything deal to deal with the kernel. We're, um, problems with the kernel are real bad for your cloud. Um, and we've, we have learned the hard way on that, so we wanted to uh, treat that very carefully. We also wanted to be able to update the kernel whenever we needed to, because security buildings come out and we want, to, we want to roll a patch out. We can't wait um, multiple weeks doing testing, things like that. And then the last option here is uh, some, of the, some vendors and solutions will say, okay, here's an agent. You're gonna put this on every single VM. And um, while that is also a viable solution, we didn't 
want that because we're in our OpenStack environment, we don't have access uh, to any of our customers, um, consumers of the cloud, their VMs. So we can't install it there, and we can't really um, tell our customers to install something on there. So, so, that, so that was out. So basically, none of these options really worked for us. <laughs> um, but, and what we, uh, but what we, the good thing is we found uh, a solution, and we worked really closely with a company called Cloudvisory um, for over a year, actually. Um, and they provide a solution. It's 100% software-based, and what it does is it provides a, this, uh, it works at this, we call it the security management um, plane, if, if you think of it in, as a model like this. And it interacts directly with uh, the Neutron API, which it continues to be the control plane. So we keep the cloud-native security controls in place. Um, but it also kind of extends the functionality um, that you would get from, a, from Neutron, because uh, one, it abstracts away some of the complexity and the, and the error proneness. Um, it provides the ability to actually monitor and audit in the whole environment near real time. Um, and you can set controls in place to remediate changes and things like that. So I'm going to turn it over to Richard, who's going to real quickly talk about Cloudvisory platform and then, and then demo it. So here we go. What's, how much uh, total time do we have here? Yeah. To 20 minutes. 20 minutes? Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, Jason. I appreciate that introduction. See if I can uh, manage the controls here. Um, so I just want to I want to repeat a couple things that I, I was typing out as Jason was talking um, in terms of some of the things he was looking to, to manage from a security perspective with regards to OpenStack. One, he was concerned about that east-west threat. Something does get into uh, uh, an instance, and it has that ability to travel east-west. What am I going to do about that? Um, there's not a lot of visibility into the health and security of the environment. Once I deploy uh, virtual instances and this related security controls, it's like a black box. Um, there's no monitoring of those security controls. How do I quickly troubleshoot and fix security problems when they pop up? And ultimately, uh, how do I deliver not just compliance, but real-time compliance. How do I know that the environment is healthy and that the security controls remain as they're supposed to remain uh, in terms of how they were initially deployed? Um, and also, I heard this, this requirement for RBAC control, if you will. And for us, all of this gets delivered through this separate security management plane. So think of this, this uh, place where you can go and control all of this, the management of this, the monitoring of it, the enforcement of policy, but it's separate from the data plane or the infrastructure plane, and it's loosely coupled. And it gives you a tremendous amount of power by setting the world up this way. So first off, and I'll, I'm going to jump into demos here very quickly, uh, what this platform does is it provides continuous discovery and visualization of the cloud infrastructure as it changes. So you're going to be spinning up the environment, we're going to discover that. You're going to spin up additional workloads, we're going to discover that. And you can see sort of uh, some of that idea here uh, in the little visual image there. Uh, we're going to be monitoring any policies that have been deployed. We're going to note any changes or updates that happen. If any of those go against what the compliance state is, we're going to identify and detect those, um, those non-compliant policies or non-compliant data flows. So you deploy security groups and now you see data flows that are popping up that don't match those. Well, that's, that's an indication that we potentially have uh, that east-west malware threat that we want to take care of. So discovery and visualization uh, is number one. We then have this uh, ability to do, so while today we're, fo we're talking about OpenStack, this is about hybrid multi-cloud security policy management. So we can do AWS, Azure, Google Compute, VMware, et cetera, and so forth. So it's about giving you, again, that single uh, security management control plane that can deliver policy and control out to these hybrid environments should you need that. Um, it does uh, granular policy micro-segmentation. You kind of get that idea here uh, from the, the picture here where we're able to set policies up um, in a variety of different ways so that they are very segmented and very granular. And again, this is one of the things that protects against the east-west threat along with the next, next piece, which is real-time 
uh, policy and uh, flow monitoring to make sure the environment always stays compliant. And again, I'll show you this in the demo so it'll become uh, more clear. Um, and then we want to be able to do enforcement. So we know what the policy should be. If somebody maliciously or even accidentally changes that policy, we want to be able to recover from it right away. We don't want to have to go through some kind of change management exercise or some long troubleshooting exercise because all the while that these policies are changed, the environment could be down. And that'll, that'll be clear in the demonstration. At the end of the day, we're reducing the human middleware piece of things. We're lowering costs. We're speeding up uh, operations through fast change management. We're hardening security. And we're hopefully uh, very successfully thwarting uh, nation state hackers. So uh, with that said, let me pop out of PowerPoint here. And I am going to pop this up. So first thing I want to do is, oh, is there Am I not going to be able to project this up? Show mirroring options. Well, this is. Okay, apologies. Yep. All right. So uh, you heard our back control was was one of those requirements that Jason had. So I want to just I want to talk about this idea of multi-tenancy that the environment we're going to show you is designed to allow you to scope what an administrator can do, what a business user or an IT user or security administrator uh, can see and do within the environment. So I'll do this very quickly here. Um, so right out of the gate, this is the dashboard that you come in. If you look on uh, the uh, left side of the screen there, you see that this is a hybrid environment. So it's got AWS, Azure. Uh, it's got even Kubernetes um, along with OpenStack. Um, and so this is just the plain, the, the dashboard that you come into so you can very quickly understand the health of your environment. We can tell you uh, where there are potential uh, faults and issues. Um, and then we have this idea of visualization, the exact thing that Jason was looking for, where we can really uh, show you exactly what's going on, again, in a hybrid environment. Ultimately, I'll focus in on... Uh, on OpenStack for the demos today, but you can see here, this is a, a very complicated environment. This is a security administrator who can see everything. And I'm just going to uh, quickly flip screens here. Um, uh, th this, is, this is a connection summary, so I can click on a workload and get a connection summary um, so that I can see exactly what's going on for any individual virtual machine within in my environment, OpenStack or otherwise. Um, and I'm showing you that here. And what I'm going to do uh, after this is I'm going to pop into uh, uh, logging in as a different user. Let me just close out of this. And you'll see here that you'll no notice the menu items there. So you've got manage, configure, administrate. Um, now I'll log in as a different user. And you'll see that that administration uh, item is not there. And now when I go to visualize what this user can see, it's tremendously scoped down. Same environment, I can only see AWS and Azure, for example. Okay? So we, we have this ability to slice and dice this down to the project level so you can really control uh, who can see, do what, and manage uh, exactly what you want them to. All right, one, one last uh, peek at this through an auto finance administrator. We'll visualize that. And again, this person can only see Kubernetes containers and uh, OpenStack environment. Okay. I'm going to pop out of this, and we'll go on to the second case. So I want to I quickly do this idea of discovery so you can see uh, what it is we do here. So this will be done in OpenStack. Uh, I'm going to drill into a series of projects as part of this OpenStack account. And right here, I've just opened up one of those projects, the HRM project. And you see one workload, HRM01, just one uh, virtual machine is currently there. I'm going to go out and run a quick orchestration script. I'm just showing you here in OpenStack, same thing. That was just, by the way, just, that was just to make the quick point that we're reading OpenStack live. We're reading everything uh, from within OpenStack and displaying it in Cloudvisory. So we're going to run, a, run a, uh, an orchestration script here, quickly spin up some additional workloads, 
Um, I'll go back to OpenStack so you can see that uh, those workloads are now available inside of OpenStack, all right, just to let you know that they're there. And now I'm going to go back to Cloudvisory, and here you see in the visualization environment, same thing. Those two additional workloads within that HRM project have now appeared. Now, as we get into the use cases, you'll see not just the workloads, but the data flows that are happening between those work, uh, workloads as well. So let me go ahead and pop you to the next one. Now we want to talk about this idea of fast troubleshooting. How do I identify problems in my environment? Uh, you know, again, when there are security group problems, your applications actually can not work. We just had a, a recent situation where a, a prospective customer called us because they had, uh, they had a live environment. They had to move to their backup environment because they were having problems with their live production environment. They moved to backup, and the applications weren't working. And they had no idea why, and they were troubleshooting code. They were looking all everywhere which way. Turned out it was problems with security groups. So it is very critical to be able to do this um, and troubleshoot the environment very quickly. So what I'm going to do here is just open up uh, the environment, show you how we can se select what it is we actually visualize. So I'm just picking five objects here, and I'll view the selection. You see I dramatically scope the environment down. And I have here a very quick demo app that just has two tiers. It's got a web tier here and a database tier. You see that that's inside uh, an OpenStack account and inside what's called the order project. And I'm going to go out and show you what that little demo app does. It's pretty simple. I just load a web page, and it opens up this button. And I click this access order button. Oh, it won't load. Database, something's wrong. I can't access the database. In, in Cloudvisory, I show you right away what the problem is. You see that there is a green line from the internet into the web tier. I can get to the web tier, but the web tier can't talk to the database tier, and this happens all the time. It's just a misconfiguration issue. Um, we can turn this uh, very quickly into a solved problem. All we do is, um, and I, what I want to show you here quickly are just the rules. So these are the OpenStack rules. Notice no outbound rules on the right side of the screen, right? There's no way for that web tier to talk to the database tier. So I'm just going to click on that red line, and I'm going to say Add Policy. And I do all the calculations here. I know what needs to be added as rules for the uh, web tier. I know what has to be added as rules. You see there, uh, the 3306 port is what needed to be added. I know what needs to be added to the database tier. I'm going to go out to the app. I'm going to refresh the page. And all of a sudden, when I click the button, the database loads. Right? That's how critical these security groups are and how fast you need to be able to troubleshoot them to keep your environment up and running. And here now, again, you see in Cloudvisory, sure enough, everything's green. Look what we deployed. If I dig into the rules here, again, these are the real OpenStack security groups. Now you see that the ports, the 3306 ports are there on both the web tier and the database tier. Here are the rules of the database tier. Uh, and the inbound rules to allow the web tier to talk to the database inbound are there as well. So in one fell swoop, we took care of that problem very quickly, and we deployed policies at both ends of the issue. All right, moving on, I'm going to jump down to uh, compliance first, and I'm, and I'm going to come back to this idea of large-scale policy provisioning and change management. So this is the idea of compliance. I've deployed uh, some virtual machines. I've deployed security policies related to those virtual machines. Somebody goes in and either maliciously or accidentally mucks with those security controls in OpenStack. How do I know that happened? I would have no way of knowing that happened unless I have a way to monitor and manage this. So once again, I'm going to go out to my demo app here. Um, I just want to show you it's working, right? So I can, I can access the database. Everything's good. Um, within Cloudvisory, you see I have green lines. Everything's good. And now I want to show you the rules. So you see here, um, just look on the left side of your screen. You see the port 80s there? I just want you to be aware of those port 80s. And we're going to go into the OpenStack interface. And administrator's doing his daily job. And he pops into uh, OpenStack here and goes into that rule set. Um, and says manage rules. And here are those rules. And he's going to click, 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 and delete. OK, I don't get any warning I'm hurting the application. I'm just confirming that I deleted those rules. They're gone. And what's the impact of that? Well, let's go back to that little test app. And I try to load this page. There's no port 80 to get from the internet to the app, so it won't load. Right? We go back to Cloudvisory. You'll notice at the top there, there's an enforcement violation right at the top. 
I'm going to drill into that enforcement violation, and it's going to show that very thing that was just done. We uncovered right away, you see it says removed, removed, removed. We detected that those port 80s were removed, and ordinarily in production, you probably would want this to be automatically rolled back. For the purposes of the demo, you see the, uh, the green button over there, right? Roll back, and we're just going to go ahead and roll this back to the compliant state. And we'll go back to OpenStack, refresh this, and you'll see that those port 80s are right back in place. Okay. What's the impact on the application? Just what you'd expect. I'll reload the page, and it will load. And I can access the order list. Right. So again, that's how, again, critical it is to be monitoring for real-time compliance that your security groups remain in that golden state. All right. Similarly, I want to be monitoring the environment uh, for potential east-west attacks. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get attacked. There's no doubt about it. Piece of malware is going to show up. Uh, how can I find that out? If I'm watching the data flows, so we're just going to drill into uh, things here, and you see, just watch this uh, HRM01 uh, workload there. Um, what we're doing is the following. You've got deployed security groups, so there are certain rules that are allowed for that workload. And we're watching the data flows every minute of every day to make sure that those data flows match the deployed security controls. And as long as they match, everything's good and green, right? <clears throat> we're going to show you what it looks like when a piece of malware actually goes after that workload. Let me just uh, I'm gonna open up the environment here. We're going to go out and run a little malware script. Uh, that's going to simulate this attack. And you know what happens when malware gets in there. It starts scanning all the ports. So you'll see what happens in the visualization here. We can detect an alert. Bam, look at that. Those ports are being scanned. There's a whole bunch of red lines because those are all attempts at communications that go against policy. Right? So once again, the policy state matters. We've blocked them. That's why they're dashed red lines. But now what we want to do is shut down this threat. And we're going to do that by quarantining this asset. Again, we're going to do it manually so you can see it happen. Well, first, I want you to see all the outbound rules. You see the seven outbound rules on the right side of your screen? The way we shut this down so that that uh, malware can't get anywhere is we're going to just shut down all outbound communications in one fell swoop. So again, would normally be an automated action. You're going to see me go out, click change the state to quarantine. Yes, you want to quarantine. I do. And immediately what that's going to do is shut down all those outbound communications. They're gone. And the reason why they're gone, I can show you through the rule set, is because, look, all the outbound rules are gone. All right, so this is about really protecting your environment. How else would you do this if you're not watching 24 by 7 in an automated fashion and comparing what's going on to the actual compliant uh, data flows? So this all brings us to uh, the last part of the, the demo here which is about how we actually do all this automated provisioning and ongoing management and monitoring. And as Jason was talking about, he was mentioning there has to be a way to organize the world. He was talking about using tags, which is one of the many ways that we have of managing policy. So you would deploy a tag along with the orchestration of your VM, and based on what that tag is, one or more tags, we're going to deploy certain policies to that virtual machine. As well, just based on a, a workload being in a certain project, it can obtain certain policies. So we have many different ways to slice and dice the environment so that it can be managed in an automated fashion. So let's look at what a policy screen looks like in Cloudvisory. I'm going to drill into this idea of a PCI policy, because you heard Jason mention they have a PCI environment. You have a variety of different projects that need to access that PC environment, PCI environment, but it's limited. Not everyone is allowed to access that. So you see that um, there is a series of uh, inbound and outbound policies that have been designed as part of this policy definition. And you'll also see that there's a tag related to it. It says compliance equals PCI. All right? So we're searching for any virtual machine, any instance that has that tag. And if it has that tag, we're going to uh, basically deploy these inbound and outbound policies. I want to call out that right now, here on the right side, there are no workloads. There are no virtual instances that are associated to this policy yet. All right, so let me just show you the rest of the policy. You're seeing the uh, 443 ports there for inbound here, the outbound policies. There's a series of them and no workloads. 
I'm going to uh, click on a couple of projects here. No objects are found in the SAS project. No objects are found in the SAP project. I'm going to go ahead and run an orchestration script, a couple of orchestration scripts, and I'm going to spin up some new workloads. And if you watch the screen, you'll see in the middle of that code, um, I, can, I can actually stop it and I think point it out to you, uh, you'll see where it says uh, compliance equals PCI, right? So all we did was when we orchestrated the uh, virtual instance, we put that tag in. We didn't deploy any security groups. That's all going to happen uh, uh, as we discover the environment. As soon as we discover those virtual machines, we discover the tag as well, and we're automatically going to apply the policy. So now as I open the SAS project, now all of a sudden there's three workloads there. I'm going to click on one, and you'll see a couple things. You'll see that it has the tag here. PCI, right? So we discovered that. When we discovered the workload, we also discovered any metadata. So it's got that tag. And now we're going to drill into the rules, and you'll see that it has those very rules, the 443 ports and all the outbound rules that you saw there are automatically delivered. Same thing on SAP, three workloads spun up there. I click on one, it's got the PCI tag, and the same exact set of consistent rules have been deployed to two different projects. This just as well could have been a VPC in AWS. It could have been a, re a resource group in Azure. We can deploy across environments consistently. We interpret the policy and deploy it directly to OpenStack, AWS, Azure, et cetera, in the language, in the policy language of that provider. So this is a, a, a very powerful way to manage policy. You now see that we have a nice inventory, which is great for audit. Which workloads in, in my environment have access to the PCI environment? I can see that right here, okay? So now I want to show you why this is at yet even more powerful, because what about change management? What about when I have to alter policy, update policy? Now, we're just showing you for demo purposes six workloads here, but imagine an environment with 4,000 workloads or 10,000 workloads that needed to get a policy update. How are you going to do that, and how are you going to manage it? As Jason said, are you going to use templates and spreadsheets? You have to do a tremendous number of calculations across all of these workloads and all the things they have to talk to if you don't have a management platform like this. So I'm going to go in, and I'm going to update this rule set. Let me just go back to the policy screen. Um, we'll go into that PCI policy. We're going to do an update to the policy definition. So we're going to add a policy, right? new outbound policy. <clears throat> and we're going to add a, a TCP port um, uh, 636 to this. Right? And then we're just going to say, add this rule. So we're just changing the policy definition then we're going out automatically behind the scenes doing the calculations that are required to deploy that across any workloads that, need, that, that already have that PCI tag. I'll go in and just uh, drill through. One of the things we can do here is edit scope for the visualization uh, UI so that I can take a look at exactly what I want to take a look at. If you're managing very large environments, as Jason was, you want to be able to drill into the exact thing you want to see. So now when I look at that rule set, you'll see that the 636 port has been provisioned. So there's no guesswork. There's no you know, manual provisioning. There's no writing complex scripts. This is all being calculated and delivered. There you see it again in one of the other workloads, the 636 ports that were part of that policy update. So I, I want to just uh, summarize here by jumping back to my PowerPoint, if I can. So at the end of the day, what, what we're doing here is we're trying to dramatically simplify the environment for you uh, by giving you a singular interface for, for cloud policy automation. So again, we did all this today on OpenStack, but this works across public and private cloud environments and across providers. So you can create policy definitions that are ultimately usable across all of these different environments. We'll translate for you. 
Um, it discovers and visual, visualizes these multi-cloud infrastructures. Again, not just OpenStack, but AWS, Azure, VMware, et cetera, and so forth. And it defines that context by looking at the metadata, by looking at what part of the infrastructure it's in, by looking at what its role is, maybe application or application tier, um, we can ultimately define and provision policy. And then we are looking at the data flows and we're visualizing any critical security violations. We automate the provisioning of policy. We automate the rapid change management as you just saw me demo. And what we are doing through all of this is we're delivering micro-segmentation to thwart uh, the east-west threat. With all of this, we don't wanna just provision it, we wanna monitor it. We wanna make sure there's real-time compliance of the security controls and the actual data flows that are happening between the workloads to make sure there isn't malware coming in, to make sure there isn't anybody uh, maliciously or accidentally misconfiguring the environment which could bring it down. And as you saw in the very first part of the demo, it is meant uh, for cross-discipline use. So we manage this in a multi-tenant uh, manner and we have role-based control so that it can be used by DevOps, security, um, and even a uh, line of business. Okay. That's it. I thank you for your time. I'm, I guess we're, at, we're out of time for questions. Do you guys have any questions? You, you, if you, any questions? And, yeah. Uh, organizationally, how did you guys overcome that at Time Warner? Uh, you talked about the dichotomy between the DevOps team and the security team. Did the solution come first, or did you get buy-in from upper management that you had to find a solution? Um, the, this, well, the solution, the solution really came first, right? I, the biggest, biggest problem, that, that cultural problem there, had to do with the lack of visibility. Um, and once, we were, once you're able to provide that visibility um, and then be able to kind of define who was going to control what, um, that, that is what helped overcome that, yeah. Please, sir. Uh, you mentioned that you're, uh, you're monitoring for changes. Um, now, looking at your screen, your, your changes are going into what looks like IP tables. Uh, are you monitoring the changes that are only coming through your interface, or are you actually monitoring the changes in IP tables itself? So if somebody compromises root, for example, and directly modifies it, does your system catch it? Lee Soon, step up to the microphone. You, you go, go over. Go right to it. It's not IP tables, right? It is actually monitoring at the API level in OpenStack. So OpenStack has this thing called security groups, right? The security groups control the traffic that goes in and out of every VM that's showing up in a particular hypervisor or every container that shows up in a particular hypervisor. So the security groups is what we are monitoring. So we go do API calls and make sure that the security groups have the same rules that the policy is defined in the state for that particular to to set outside. of workloads. Okay. So the, the, the management they need to here is time. really a policy definition that defines the state of the infrastructure security in OpenStack. Yeah, so we time. keep discovering what's changing. If something changes in the security groups, we will detect because it's non-compliant the policy. Right. In addition to that, we go and monitor the flows because the flows have to follow these policies as well. That's why if somebody puts a malware inside a particular workload and the malware starts scanning non-compliant rules, meaning connections that are not allowed, that are being blocked by the security group, we will discover them and say, okay, there's alert. There's something going wrong with this particular workload because there are connections that are non-compliant to the policies going everywhere right now. So and that's what you saw on the day. So um, I, we, we want to ask questions or answer questions. So I think we're going to go outside the door. If there's another session that needs to switch over in here, so. Please, please just grab Lassoon, my, myself or Jason. We'll be right out, uh, outside the door. <laughs>